Hi, my name is Jordan Young, and I'm the executive director of the Women's International Studies Center. Today, I'm really excited to be here with Lois Bunce to discuss a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts here at WISC. We're going to talk a lot about giving and giving back philanthropy. Um, Lois is a 35-year professional in nonprofit management, education, and fundraising. Um, her recent project is a book about women in philanthropy for CASE, the Council for the Advancement of Support in Education, and it will be coming out in 2021. I'm really excited to have the chance to sit down with Lois and ask her about her project and get a chance to hear about what she's been working on. On. Thank you, Lois, for joining me. Thank you, Jordan, for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. Can you start by telling us about this project and how you came to it? Certainly, certainly. Um, well, I've always been interested in women and philanthropy, and uh, it's, it's just been a topic that's interested me throughout my career. And uh, in my work in nonprofits and in fundraising, um, I met so many inspiring women, uh, women who give, uh, who make investments in their community, and specifically in programs for women and girls. And uh, I was just always admired so many of them. And uh, several years ago, I transitioned from my role as CEO of United Way uh, into a consulting practice. And one of the things I thought about doing as part of my consulting practice was to work more in the area of women's philanthropy. So I launched upon this kind of crazy idea that I would start interviewing women philanthropists to collect their stories and hear what motivates them, what inspires them, how do they make decisions. And um, I had been involved with a women's philanthropy initiative at our United Way, and it had been extremely successful. And so I started with local philanthropists that I knew, and they were very gracious about sharing their stories and, and telling me what inspires them. And then uh, fortunately, through the Iowa Women's Foundation director, uh, who had been a director at other women's foundations in the United States, uh, I told her about the project and she started connecting me with philanthropists across the United States. Uh, some well-known philanthropists like Abigail Disney and Helen LaKelly Hunt and uh, women who have obviously played a major role in the development of philanthropy and are very generous philanthropists themselves. <laughs> And that also led to uh, some connections with the other women's foundations and uh, talking to some of their directors and finding out how they work with women. So the stories were great. And I was looking for themes about uh, when I started talking to all these women, I think I've talked about 70 of them now. What are some of their themes? And then I also realized that uh, the stories were very interesting but I needed the research too, to kind of back up what was what I call more qualitative research or field studies. So fortunately, um, Indiana University and the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy has a Women's Philanthropy Institute. And for the past 20 years, they've been doing a tremendous amount of research about women's philanthropy. How do women give? How do they think about philanthropy. Um, most importantly, we do it differently than men. <laughs> and uh, trying to capture really the data to document what we kind of intuitively knew but couldn't really prove. And so I started uh, doing a lot of research, reading their studies, and um, trying to put together the stories and the themes I found from the stories with the research. And one of the other things that uh, began to kind of amaze me is that the potential women have to give is absolutely huge. Um, even though women earn less, we take more time out for childcare responsibilities, um, many of us don't work in high paying jobs, there still is a tremendous wealth capacity growing. 
And um, in 2014, there was a study done uh, by Women Moving Millions, which is a group where women give a million dollars. <laughs> I'm not part of it. But <laughs> and um, what they found was that U.S. women have the capacity to give $230 billion annually, which just totally shocked me. And then the Rockefeller Foundation has also talked about something that we call the dual wealth transfer. And what they mean by that is uh, many women will inherit from their parents when their parents pass on. And as a baby boon, boomer woman, <laughs> Uh, I know my parents were the saving generation, you know, they saved every penny and they passed it on to their family. So women inherit from their parents, but then secondly, many of them will inherit from a spouse because we have longer lifespans than, uh, than men. So this dual wealth transfer uh, is going to result in many women inheriting significant amounts of money and have then the potential to give philanthropic. So, you know, we had this capacity that was growing. We have the research that talks about how women give, and now we have the stories. And so I started thinking about how do we put this all together and started reading the history also of how women's philanthropy developed. Um, and this year is a very important year because it's the 100th anniversary of the suffrage movement and the right to vote. So that was like the first thing that happened in women's philanthropy was, you know, we used our power to get the right to vote. And then, you know, 50 years later in the 70s and 80s, uh, we came together again around women's rights and uh, many of the women's foundations developed. And then like the third stage has been about 2005 when the capacity really blew open and, and women started giving very large gifts. And so part of my uh, theme is, I think we're, on, we're in this fourth wave. I think we're in a fourth stage of, of potential for women to give. And the challenge now is to help fundraisers and people who work in nonprofits and other organizations capture that possibility and engage women in a new way. So the book is really geared towards the philanthropy community it's written for people who work in nonprofits and, and want to engage more donors. And um, the feedback I got from the editor I hired was, you know, we, we need to have some structure. And so um, taking all this information, we structured it around a six step process, really, that takes um, uh, women and people who work with women kind of through a process of how do you develop awareness uh, of what the issues are, um, how do you help women align their interests and their values and their wealth uh, with the things that they want to accomplish, and then how do we marry that, how do we match that so we can engage more women and they have a successful experience. And then most importantly, how do we acknowledge and thank them? Uh, and finally, then, you know, what do we achieve when we, when we get through all of that? And so uh, the final chapters in the book are really about what are some of the su successful programs that have been developed, uh, particularly in the areas of healthcare and education, uh, women-owned businesses, and getting women on bo more boards, you know, empowering women to, to have influential roles. And, and also, um, uh, the final chapter is really about how do we engage women of color and how do we engage uh, under, underrepresented populations in the, in the philanthropy world. And, um, Fortunately, through the Women's Funding Network in California, I had the opportunity to connect with uh, Amelia Delgado from HIP, which is Hispanics in Philanthropy. And she was great in sharing with me what is happening in their community and how they're engaging women uh, in philanthropy in the US and in Mexico. 
uh, and uh, Melanie Brown from the Great Gates Foundation uh, and Teresa Younger from Miss Foundation uh, shared some information about how they work with women of color, specifically black women and African American women, <clears throat> to engage more of them as donors. Um, and then also uh, talked about how we get more involved in, in uh, gender lend lens investing, meaning, you know, when we, when we have these funds at some of the foundations, how do we make sure that the investments that we're making promote the issues that, that women care about and have good practices within their own organizations uh, that nurture and sustain and uh, support and grow women. So um, it's it's been a very interesting journey <laughs> to, say, to say the least. It's it's evolved into something I I didn't think it would be when I started, uh, but it's been just a you know fascinating to uh, hear the stories. Uh, I've been amazed how um, willing women have been uh, to share their story, mm -hmm. uh, and they you know the themes that I found were all of these women who give um, all had a role model of some sort or a mentor. So they all identified somebody in their family. Uh, it could have been a family member. It could have been someone from their work who uh, inspired them because they watched their giving and they observed it. Uh, even if, if the parent was only a volunteer and didn't actually give money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another theme that we, we found is obviously women want to connect to a cause. You know, they want to really make a difference. So they investigate things a lot deeper sometimes than men do. Um, they want to give together. They like to collaborate. So they like to do things socially. Um, and that's why things like giving circles where women get together and pool their money have become so popular in the United States um, because women like to connect to each other. Um, mm -hmm. And they also like to create change, system change, as well as pro programmatic change. Um, I interviewed one woman, um, Lila Igram, who's a Muslim woman, and she's, she's designed a digital platform to collect philanthropists with uh, developing countries and the needs for women and girls in, in third world countries. Um, and, you know, because she said, I wanted to create change, but I can't go all over the world. <laughs> and obviously now that's even more difficult. So, you know, she created something new and different. So there are lots of wonderful stories and, um, and good data. And the bottom line is women give more than men. Uh, we are more generous. Um, in fact, baby boomer women give 156% more than men. So, I mean, single women give more than single men. Um, and so the capacity is there and we care. We care about our communities. We care about our families and we want to give back and make a difference. So I guess I'll stop there wow. in a minute. Wow. Thank you. It sounds like just an incredible resource, not just for um, nonprofits and institutions, but also for possibly for women who are looking to make a bigger impact in their giving. Um, I want to ask you a lot of, of questions. Um, I'm going to start with sort of the, the obvious. Um, since we're in a pandemic, how does that impact philanthropic giving? Here in Santa Fe, we've seen lots and lots of giving to our community foundation and outpourings of support for food banks and institutions like that. How does the pandemic affect giving on right. a bigger bigger scale? Yeah, well, it, it is completely new territory. I mean, this is kind of one of the biggest things we've ever had to deal with in the philanthropy community. Um, you know, the good news is that women give during a crisis. And um, the Lilly School of Philanthropy actually found in 2017 and 18, when we had a lot of the world disasters, crisis mm -hmm. going on, 40% of women versus 33% of men gave. So, so again, women are stepping up, they, you know, they see the need. And then in 2008, after the economic uh, downturn and crisis, 
women gave a higher percentage of their income uh, in charitable giving than men gave. And so um, women will give during a crisis. I mean, we, we are very tugged at our heartstrings um, when, we, when we see needs in our community and when we see needs in our family. So I think you're gonna see more women giving during a pandemic because they will, they will identify with the community needs me, you know, my family needs me. Um, I think, uh, and I don't have data to back this up, but I think we, we're gonna see more giving obviously to healthcare and to basic needs. Uh, mm -hmm. People are needing food and shelter and those sorts of things. Um, I think, unfortunately, we may not see as much giving in, to some of arts and culture, uh, which is sad because we, we still need those things to keep us alive and vibrant uh, yeah. during, the, during these trying times. But yeah. uh, women, women do step up, and I think we'll see, see more of it. Um, I know the last statistics I've seen on the giving to the pandemic are, are very, very high. Um, and I know for ourselves in our community, we had a massive flood in 2008 here. And I thought our giving would um, just all go to flood related stuff and we'd forget about everything else. And actually all the giving came up, you know? Yeah. So, they, so they gave to the disaster, but they gave more to other things too. So yeah. I'm, I'm gonna remain hopeful. During COVID, how can women maximize their philanthropic giving when they're making choices about where to give and what to give to? Well, I think like in any situation, it's really good to investigate uh, the causes that, that you care about um, because they're, you know, they're gonna be a lot of pop-up things that happen now and it's really important that you do investigate um, what they are so you make sure you're giving to a credible organization or ask people who are in the philanthropy community um, to help guide you. Um, uh, one of the probably safest ways to do it is uh, many times the community foundation or United Way or a foundation, maybe even a, a, another private foundation might develop a fund mm -hmm. that is specifically COVID related. And that's a good opportunity to give because it's already in an institution that has credibility. Um, and then they can vet the needs uh, through the foundation of where to put the money. And um, it takes a little bit of the responsibility off of you to say, oh, I can't decide, you know, should I send my money to housing? Should I send it to food? Because it, it would be distributed um, through the foundation based on what the community's most important needs are. Yeah. It's um, so interesting. Um, we hear about women not earning as much um, or wealth gaps between men and women. And you emphasize that women give more and that they do philanthropy differently. Can you talk a little bit more about some of those differences? Well, I think, um, first of all, women, uh, women give with their heads and with their hearts. Um, so we, we operate many times out of empathy. I mean, we care about our communities. And I think Harvard um, Business Review did a study about, you know, women in third world countries, when they get money, they, they give back the majority of their money into their communities and their families. So we really care about our communities and we care about our families first. So um, we're very driven by that by that and we really are driven by wanting to investigate causes and understand them and then get very connected and maybe it's as a volunteer first and then building into more of a philanthropic um, uh, financial gift. Um, and what's interesting is women are not motivated by competition. Uh, men are voted by motivated by competition a lot more. Uh, so like if you go to charity auction and you see the bidding going on and people start outbidding each other, um, women don't tend to get into that as much. Um, they also don't tend to like as much public recognition, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the name on the building or, you know, make a big deal about it. And, and um, so what happens is a lot of their philanthropy is a little more hidden you know, they're giving, but 
it, it, it's hidden and we have to look for it. And I think particularly when we get into communities of color, we find that, that uh, the traditional ways uh, fundraisers look for, you know, where do people give, look at the board list or whatever. In community of color, sometimes it's much more hidden because it's informal mm -hmm. and people are help, helping in their networks or they're volunteering outside of a formal organization. Um, so we, we have to always, you know, put on our cultural lens when we're looking at these things too. Um, so, and this, this community piece is very important for women is um, let's connect it, let's do it together. Um, and so I think if you can bring networks of women together, uh, maybe some of it's social, uh, maybe it's um, let's work on a co-create a project together so we all um, can have some input in how it's designed then I think uh, they have more investment. Yeah, it sounds like there's a bigger relational component. That seems like a, a key takeaway for organizations to know that women philanthropists want to have a relationship. With oh, the yeah, absolutely. And, and we kind of talk about that in, in one of the chapters. It's about you know, how do you, how do you look at prospects, um, women, but then how do you actually go in and, and make an ask and establish a connection? And that happens over a period of time. And in fact, I believe there's kind of this continuum of women start out maybe giving small or maybe somebody asks them give to my, you know, school project for my kid and I'll give to yours, that sort of thing. But then if they really start to think about and get into it, they really start investing. And then their philanthropy grows, but their relationship with the organization and particularly with the person asking is, is critical. Um, and the more continuity you can have in the organization, uh, the deeper the relationships you can build, usually the better the philanthropy will be. Um, you mentioned that some of most of the women that you interviewed had a mentor or someone that they were inspired by that kind of uh, coached them or um, encouraged them to be someone who gave back. Um, can you tell us about um, that or one of those stories? Um, I find that very fascinating. At WISC, we like to talk about women that inspire us. <laughs> Right, yeah. Well, um, um, I'll probably think of several stories, but the first one that pops into my head uh, is a, a woman by the name of Carla Harris, and she's a African-American woman. She's a VP at Morgan Stanley in New York City. You know, highly successful woman, Harvard grad, I mean, the whole thing. But she talked about, um, you know, when she, was, when she was growing up, you know, she would go and you know, visit nursing homes. She's a singer too. And, and so she, she kind of watched this community stuff. But when she got uh, into her job at Morgan Stanley, she had a woman executive that she met in New York City that's, that took her under her wing and said, you know, you have a very successful career and you need to figure out how to give back. So I'm going to take you to some nonprofits that introduce you. I'm going to and she watched her and watched how she gave and introduced her to the New York Food Bank. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Carla talks about that she really inspired me to get involved in philanthropy uh, because I watched what she did. And, um, and she was somebody I really respected because we were one of the few women in a big world of finance, you know, which is very male dominated. Um, but she was always extremely appreciative of that, you know, mm -hmm. of, of seeing that. Uh, so she's one of the, the first um, stories that popped into mind because I actually use her in my mentoring story about she had, she had a mentor. <clears throat> mm -hmm. A giving mentor. Yeah. A giving mentor, yeah. And, you know, for a number of women who came from, from I would say, very modest backgrounds, Many of them talked about they watched their mother be involved in a lot of volunteer work. Um, uh, a mother, you know, sometimes it was a teacher or an aunt or someone, 
but they would get involved in all the things in the community, you know, whether it was the PTA or the, you know, Girl Scouts or the food bank or whatever, but they were giving their time uh, even if they couldn't give, you know, any money. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, well, that's what I should do. You know, I should give my time. And then eventually if they got to a position where they had financial resources, it was like, well, now I can really give yep. some money too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lewis, what women have inspired you and your work? Uh, well, I certainly from the, from the stories and interviews that I did, um, uh, I was, extremely surprised that Abigail Disney was willing to talk to me. <laughs> uh, uh, and she is quite a philanthropist. She's quite an activist also, if you know anything about her. Uh, she comes out very strongly in support of, you know, we have to take care of people. And she is certainly in a position where uh, she has tremendous resources to do that, but she feels a tremendous responsibility to give back and really uh, steps up and does that. So um, I love talking to her and she was very inspiring about it. You know, we just we got to do more. <laughs> so from a philanthropist, her and Helen, Helen LaKelly Hunt were both very inspirational. Um, Martha Taylor, who's been at the University of Wisconsin, um, uh, has been a great resource for me because she's written a lot about this and, and she's, uh, I would call her kind of the mother of some of the women's philanthropy uh, movement and it's interesting Martha said my mother told me if you don't write down what you are observing about women and how they give nobody's gonna know and she wrote one of the first books about women and philanthropy so you know from a colleague standpoint um, and then you know obviously I've had women in my family who have been great great role models um, again no, nobody who can give big gifts, but certainly giving, you know, giving time and uh, wanting to give back and particularly wanting to invest in things that impact women and girls. Yeah, we, we know now, I think from research that gifts to women and girls do have a big impact because they give back and are involved in their communities and their leaders of families. Absolutely. And, you know, women do uh, women do give more to women and girls causes, obviously, than men, and you would mm -hmm. you know, kind of suspect that. But, um, you know, women's philanthropy is obviously bigger than, than that, but it's one of the things that really prompted the movement to grow is um, back in the 1970s when, when the philanthropy community started getting together, they saw, you know, the, the giving to women and girls was so minuscule it was so small that they said we've got to do something because the rest of the world doesn't do it so we're going to start our own funds we're going to start our own foundations and we're going to make it happen uh, and take control of this so it was in a sense the crisis was inspirational yeah and and women got together again <laughs> yeah they did. yeah they did and you know the women's foundations have grown tremendously um the, the giving circles um there's so many different avenues now for women to get involved um so they don't have to do it alone they certainly can but and there certainly is no shortage of causes to support <laughs> yeah uh, well, thank you, Lois. We definitely look forward to your book coming out in 2021. Um, and we also look forward to you visiting us in Santa Fe at some point when it's time to, when it's safe to travel again. Yeah, well, I would, I would love to do that. And I'm hoping, yes, that, uh, you know, the publishing houses can get back to full speed too, because the pandemic has obviously slowed everything down. But um, I've always heard, you know, lovely things about your center and the great work you do and um, giving an opportunity to so many women, you know, artists, uh, writers, you name it. Um, uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Lois, and thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks.